Minnesota Original is made possible by the State Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota. On this edition of Minnesota Original. Okay, here we go, Manny. Javier Tavera photographs Latino veterans and other Latin Americans in Minnesota. Greek immigrant Konstantinos Papadakis has been carving wood in the Byzantine style for 50 years. Jack Klatt and the Cat Swingers perform in TPT's Studio A. Can't you see you can't get much worse than me? Life's a drag but not mine. These artists and more, now on Minnesota Original. Since I was a kid, I wanted to be a storyteller. And all of a sudden with photography, I can, I can really tell a story of somebody that is alive or somebody that I imagined or, or, or anybody. A portrait, people can approach and look at them and analyze every little thing. The earrings, the makeup, the hat, the mustache, and that's something that we unfortunately don't do in the street because it's very intrusive. Here, you have the opportunity to look and to analyze and hopefully the images will talk to you. You ready? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. One more. We are at St. Mary's Church in downtown St. Paul, and we're going to photograph three sets of war veterans. Looking good. What happened to you here? Hmm? You got a little crazy with the racer? I don't know. <laughs> I must have. <laughs> post number five is a military post that is based in the west side in St. Paul. The purpose of this project, what I want to do is print this material and go and knock on the door of the Historical Society and I can give this package to them so it's there for future, future generations. Three. Are you okay there? Mm -hmm. What I like about portraiture is the contact with, with the people. So I can approach them and I can talk to them and I can learn a lot. And the main part of this is to understand. I made it a point that our job was to gather, preserve, and share the history. For younger people and people not involved or have been in the military, sometimes it's hard for them to understand the sacrifices. So I, that's why I think it's important for people to acknowledge when they see a veteran and be respectful of the flag. The way I photograph has evolved. If I was in Mexico, I would be photographing completely different things. All of a sudden, I'm in Minnesota, and that got me to think a little bit about who I am here. And I turned my, my lens to, to my community. <laughs> The show Calle Lake is a series of portraits that I took on Lake Street. I was there for a couple days, the Latino Independence Day and the Mexican Independence Day. It's just me with a tripod and a camera running up and down the, the street uh, looking for interesting people. And it's not hard to find them. By no means I try to describe the Latino community when I photograph. I really go and photograph people who I think they have something to say and, and they have such a character 
that they can tell a story by just standing in front of the camera. Me and my wife, Tina Tavera, were lucky enough to get a grant from the State Arts Board to do El Circo. And El Circo is composed, for my part, of a series of portraits. And uh, instead of going out in the street or going to somebody's home to photograph them, I invited people to share with me what would they be if they would be in a circus. And this time, I, I built the sets and I sent the backdrops to be made and I put everything together and, and I make a series of circus people. I've been following the circus for quite a while, since I was a kid. This is a new set of prints that I've been working. Completely different set of portraits that I've been doing for the past six months. And what I'm doing here is taking very close-ups of different uh, Minnesota artists, and I'm printing them in a technique called photolithography. And it's a laborious process in printing this. Uh, yeah, very different from everything that I've shot before. I'm really trying to push the, my subject to get something out of them that is buried in, inside of them. And it's an expression. Sometimes it's grotesque, sometimes it's funny, sometimes it's playful. And I've been having a lot of fun doing this new set of, of prints. I don't know what keeps me going. I know that there is something that now is physical, that if I'm not photographing or looking for an image, I start to feel like anxious. There's a pleasure in, in this. When I have the camera in a tripod and where I'm looking at somebody and when I look through the viewer and I say, yes, this is it, this is it. Maybe that's what keeps me going. This is a jacket called A Coat for Two Occasions, a garment that I made to wear to my funeral and cremation. I was in an oriental grocery once upon a time and they were having a closeout on Joss paper. It's um, decorative paper, sometimes called spirit money, that is burned ceremoniously at some Asian funerals. And as the smoke rises to the heavens, it's believed that your thoughts and your prayers are carried to your loved ones. And I thought that was such a beautiful ritual that I wanted to be able to burn my own Joss paper at my own demise. I like that tension that happens between the funny and the horrific, and that which is beautiful and is repulsive. Those tensions keep me interested, and I think that they help engage the viewer. I generally say that I'm a maker of paper garments. As a girl, my mother sewed the majority of our garments, and so I was brought up around fabric, making doll clothes, making puppets, and so for me, it was familiar territory. These are called corsets of talus, and they are um, works from a larger series. I made about 10 of these corsets. 
My work had always been about the body. I've been fascinated by the body because there's so many different ways to look at it and talk about it. But then I just got so frustrated as a graduate student painting about the body. And one day it was like this light bulb went off over my head and I just thought I should be working three-dimensionally. This one is made with bottle caps. In the summertime when I go to the drive-in theaters, I pick them up. The second one here is surfaced with dehydrated sole. It makes reference the, to skin itself. This last one here is surfaced with dehydrated cherry tomatoes, and then it's lined with these um, tassels made of human hair. Hair is a reoccurring theme in my work. It represents so many different things. When I was a girl, my father told me that eating tomatoes would make me big and strong and hairy-chested. As a small child, I recognize that chest hair was appropriate for a man, but if not, of course, for a woman. And um, that's why I stopped eating tomatoes, and I avoided it for 20 years. I like to incorporate materials that help me tell my stories. So it made sense to me that I should use those very materials, tomatoes and hairs, that tormented me. My brother went on to eat tomatoes, and you should see how hairy he turned out. This is a piece called Choker. It's about how my seasonal allergies appear to be worsening as I age. During the summertime when Minnesota is at its most beautiful, I am feeling my worst. And I seem to be taking decongestants on a daily basis as the elm seeds, in this case, are falling from the sky. So it's about that kind of cyclical process and also the kind of choking physical effects that I feel during the summertime. This is the hair of my friend Trin. I started working with handmade paper because it was the thing that most aligned or related to skin. After making sheets, they, I can turn them into yardage by adhering the small sheets together. I'm generally pulling sheets of paper and creating yardage to make the garments, or sometimes I cast the paper. Then I cover it with things that help me tell the stories. When I was in Austria, I went to my family's hometown of Spitz. And when I was there looking for evidence of my family, the apricots were in season, and they were literally falling from the trees. My husband and I ate apricots until we could eat no more. I don't worry about preserving my work. The body, of course, will change and decay in time, and so it's appropriate that my work should do the same. I love making the work. I love the material experience of handling the work, of creating patterns, of stitching the garments up, embellishing them by spending time with the work and reflecting upon the experience. Equally so, I love telling the stories. I love seeing people nod their heads in agreement. I can't imagine doing anything else.
My name is Konstantinos Papadakis. I am a Greek-American woodcarver. And I came in this city in the 8th of December, 1966. I have only $63 in my hands. Have you ever fallen in love? If you fall in love with somebody, you try to, to please it. I fall in love with the wood carving, and if I do something beautiful, something, I please it. Nine years old, I become fascinated with a sculptor in Crete. They carved my grandfather and me. How does he do that? He showed me a little bit with a jackknife what to do. Now, what can I carve? He says, hey, million of uh, leaves and trees, you know, and animals, you know, birds. Look at them and copy them, which I did. And I was proud to show my success. And he says to me, bravo. You see, I was expecting petting the back or something, you know, such. And I was a little far, and just that's bravo. But he went right to my father and said to my father, have him taught. This going to Tulsa, Oklahoma. They call it Econostasi, or alto screen in English. The whole thing is 38 feet long by 15 feet high. The scale is one and a half inch to a foot because you can able to see the details or to my large, it looks like when you the whole room. I sent them the different styles, and they asked me, which one you like? And I told them, I like this. The guy called me and says, Constantinos, what kind, what kind of style that is? I, says, I don't know. I, I drew it, and I know it, and uh, I haven't seen it anybody else. The original leaves it was something like that. It came to my head, do something, that the other guy not, did not do. And I had this little piece over here. Oh, it feels good. Then I make this leaf to see how it will look. And it was good. Just to me, you will call it Constantinos? That's it. <laughs> After they prove it, this panel. This is the exact measurements of a blow to a scale. Most of my tools, I had made my own. Even those I bought, even them, I changed them to fit what I'm doing. I have over, over 500 tools, and each one of them is a different. That tool, for example, to give me that kind of tool. For me, there is no left hand or right hand in the carving. Now, over here, this is a rough. I have to go all that rough, take all the much wood out first. Then I'm going back and I'm to go, you see, you see, I start to clean over here, make it smooth, clean around it to make the finished product. I work, it was in the state capital, traditional area. They had, they had it was only five judges. They had you know, another four chairs. They couldn't separate. The original carvings was 1905 with my carvings. I said, can you tell us what is the difference? And I had to tell them the little secrets I have done intentionally to separate the original with the, with the new ones. I have done Many churches in Florida, in New York, and everywhere around. The biggest church I've done was in uh, Louisville, Kentucky, who was 63 feet long by 14 and a half or 15 high. My pride was in uh, Charlotte, North Carolina, who is 43 feet wide by 19 and a half feet tall. That style, nobody can do it. Nobody knows. 
My teachers, they are gone, they're dead. I think I'm the last of the Puno da Critico Eptanisiaco. It's a big word. Critico Eptanisiaco style. My name is Paul Serbo. I am a, an apprentice woodcarver. Well, not really an apprentice anymore. I'm kind of a journeyman, so he does the more expertise part, and I'm kind of a tool that does the output and keeps it all going. Paul came to me, and he looks like he wanted to do it. He loved to do it. I thank him for realizing the gift that I was given and the potential that I had. And with his direction, it really blossomed into a career for me. I came to this country to make a living and to teach, to leave somebody to know how to carve. Let me tell you, his uh, manner of teaching was definitely old world. Can you show me what I'm doing next? I think that is one of the best ways of doing it because it's hands-on learning. It's not, you're not reading from the book and trying to implement it into wood. You're watching him conform the wood to what he wants it to be. And there you see how it's done from the blank piece to the finished piece. It's as simple as it can be. A lot of critiquing, a lot of critiquing. You know, it took several years before I got my first handshake, which in his book is a job well done. I feel that if I go, now I have no desire to go. My grand grandfather was 119, but she has the key of the shop. I tried to tell him direct that everything I have is yours. We're a good team. I like to create. I like to do something nobody else does. You expect me to do the best. And I promise I will do that because it's, I love my work. Not mine, but not mine. Though my wallet's empty most of the time, you feel the sun shining on my back. Listen to the sound of them old smokestacks. Mm, I never know which way I ought to go. I raise one finger to the wind, and it's down the road I go. So when you're feeling down to doubts, don't you fret and don't you pout. Well, can't you see you can't get much worse than me? Life's a drag, but not mine. But not mine Hell, though the market's always in decline You see, I don't own a fancy car Your houses, they're made of golden bars Oh, this recession, it gives me the impression That some folks must learn a lesson Cause I can't feel a thing So when your bank account is low And you're feeling like there ain't no place to go Well, it might sound funny, but you don't need too much money. Life's a drag, but not mine. Oh, I said 
life's a drag, but not mine. I left home when I was five, pedaling down the road on tempered steel. My legs too short to ride an automobile. Hell, it was sad to see me go. I saw my face on telephone poles. They raised one finger to the wind, and it's down the road I go. So when you just can't get along, I'm the last few lines of this here song. When I hear the people say, Times is hard, skies are gray. I'll be singing, Life's a drag, but not mine. I'll be singing, Life's a drag, but not mine. We got a big traditional music scene here in Minneapolis. We're really lucky. And we also have a lot of old timers that are still playing around, like Spider John Kerner and, uh, you know, Cornbread Harris, just to name a few. We, I, I know a lot of kids who travel around and a lot of people who go down to New Orleans and soak up the music down there on the other side of the river. But all those cats are really jealous of what we have up here because you can go down to Palmer's Bar and have a, you know, sit and John Kerner's there watching TV and drinking a whiskey or whatever, you know, and we're lucky to have that in Minneapolis. So I don't think people are really surprised. I think it's kind of an institution on the West Bank and it's been going on since the 70s, you know. Minnesota Original is made possible by the State Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the Citizens of Minnesota.